getting the point, not majoring on the minors. When dealing with any, any text, any writing, any speech, it's important to get what the author is intending us to get, is meaning us to get, wants us to get. If we get other things from what they say, those may or may not be what they mean, and they may or may not be important. If we get what they intend, what they mean to say, then that clearly is the main thing. So let's keep the main thing the main thing. Let me illustrate that for you. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There's a verse in there that has been a fertile hunting ground for people who want to know more about what will happen at the end, in those last days when Jesus returns. A period about which Jesus himself warns us that we can know very little except that it will come as a surprise. But nevertheless, in chapter 4, verse 12 reads like a conclusion, and verse 13 reads like an introduction. So what we've got here is the beginning of a paragraph. We'll talk briefly later about where the paragraph ends, but for now it starts in verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. That's Paul's concern in this paragraph, and it's set out clearly in the first sentence. Paul's concern is that his new converts, the brothers and sisters in Thessalonica, will not be ignorant about what will happen to people who die before Jesus returns, and will not grieve about them like all of the other people of the world who have no hope do. And so he goes on with his presuppositions. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And he goes on to explain what that means. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There first, then, verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore encourage each other with these words. So it's an encouragement, and that theme of encouragement returns again in verse 11 of chapter 5, indicating that the section, if not the paragraph, goes on into the next chapter. The next chapter is very close to Jesus' teaching about the second coming and the end of time, and is mainly a warning to be ready, because we don't know when it's going to be. Two parts in one section, dealing with the fate of the dead and with being ready. Ben Witherington, about this passage, writes, He, that's Paul, does not speak of the afterlife or the end of history for its own sake, but in service of the exhortation he's giving to his converts in Thessalonica. This shapes the character of his rhetoric here, which is about his converts being people of faith, hope, love, self-control and alertness. You see, what BW3 is saying is that Paul isn't too concerned about all the details about what the end will be like and how the timetable will work and miraculous aeronautics. What Paul's concerned about is what kind of people we are now here as a result of what we believe. So, to use this passage to construct a doctrine of the rapture is to miss the point of what Paul is doing and saying. Paul's audience were worried about what would happen to Auntie May, who is dying, if she dies before Jesus returns. And Paul is reassuring them. He's not giving a lesson in flight to meet Jesus. He's giving a pastoral reassurance that one way or another, as he puts it in verse 17, we will be with the Lord forever. Paul does not want, as he said in verse 13, Christians to grieve like the rest of humanity. Maybe this flight that Paul describes to meet Jesus is described like that because that's what he expects. Maybe it's just some cultural memory of an idea, which he takes up and uses. Maybe it's a metaphor we don't know. And it doesn't matter, because it's not the point of what Paul is on about. And what matters is the point. If we keep the main thing the main thing, then we too will learn not to grieve, because we, and the faithful dead, will be together with Jesus forever. You see, odd doctrines and weird sects 
are built on sand instead of rock, to borrow a metaphor from Jesus. What a Bible writer is trying to say, intending to say, wanting to say, is what matters. That's the rock. That we can build on. All the rest is sand. So, are you building your theology on rock or sand? That's the challenge. Getting the point and making the main thing the main thing. Bye for now.